My guest today is Brian Ware, the Assistant Director for Cybersecurity at the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency at the Homeland Security Department. Brian, welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad to be here. Today we're talking about cybersecurity. There's plenty to talk to, especially with CISA, which you guys are involved in so many different pieces and parts of cybersecurity. Let's just start at the beginning. I think one of the the big things that CISA has been doing, continues to really play a key role, is around cyber threat in intelligence sharing and how to really lower agency cyber risks. So talk to me a little bit about some of those efforts to really improve and respond to all those uh, threats and risks that agencies see. Yeah, I mean, I think when we talk about the threat information sharing, there are a lot of components or dimensions to that. And I wanna just kind of touch on a few of the things that we do just to give the, the breadth of perspective. So we engage very closely with industry in, um, we have a variety of, of legal frameworks and relationships that we've built so that uh, industry from the threat intel providers to the large IT companies can share threats that they're seeing with us. Uh, we can package and disseminate those threats. Uh, we can share information, uh, threat information back with them that they can use, uh, particularly the large IT companies, to protect on a systemic basis across their, their, their user base. So this is one part of the, the threat information sharing piece, really just um, the, the, the mechanisms and the trust that we built with key parts of industry. Um, we pair that, of course, with the, the same in the federal government space. Um, however, in that case, we've got sensors on government networks, so we're able to collect uh, the things that we see, again, package those things to disseminate to, to industry as well as to our intelligence and defense partners, where we also receive from them uh, classified threat indicators. We work with them to declassify as much of that threat information as we can so that we can share it as broadly as possible to, to really affect uh, cyber outcomes. And so the way I'm describing that right now kind of sounds like relationships and uh, meetings when we used to get together in person, um, you know, uh, forums that we have for sharing and collaboration. And those all uh, also extend into our automated uh, information sharing, our AIS system. So in this case, bi-directional systems that take the kinds of threat intelligence that we see from the, the, the full array of government visibility, and we package that into a feed that is consumed by um, you know, thousands of entities directly and many of them indirectly. So almost all of the threat intelligence providers, uh, software companies ingest that feed and provide it to, to their customers kind of through, through, their, through their products. Um, uh, it's consumed by international partners, uh, by, by corporations directly, and it's a two-way street, right? So we also receive back from them of that technical information. And so I think when, when I think about th uh, sharing threat information, it's really, it takes all of these things, right? It takes the the human element so that we have context and relationship and we trust each other enough to, to, to share. And, and, and ultimately it takes technology that can share the thousands of these things that there are uh, on a continuous and an automated basis. There's a couple things here I wanna just pull the string a little bit on. First of all is the, the, the two-way relationship. For years as I've covered CISA and, and before that obviously when it was called MPPD, the AIS program was criticized, if you will, or at least held up as, well, it's really one-way sharing. Over the last maybe three, five years, maybe a little bit longer, it's really started to evolve and, and there's the, that trust that you talk about has been happening. So w walk me through a little bit of where we are today with AIS and how that trust is, is giving you as CISA and also the federal government at large better data to make better decisions to deal with those risks. Yeah, th this is... I'm a new guy here, and so I don't have the benefit of all of the the hard fought battles of the past and and the the legacy and and sometimes even the 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 issues. But when I look at it from kind of with a fresh set of eyes, there are some very frustrating aspects to AIS uh, that are outcomes of some like really good decisions and and really kind of core and fundamental to that was uh, developing a sticks taxi standard and then transitioning it out of government into a standards making body that by the way whoever made that decision it sounds like the right kind of and good decision um however the the standard just kind of didn't evolve and and it has really limited a number of the kind of technical requirements that, that, that need to be in place to really enable more context and more valuable two-way information sharing and so we've seen some um some developments this year earlier this year 
that uh, we think are going to very soon free up a whole new evolution of, of AIS. Did I say revolution? I really meant evolution. Um, and, and so I expect to see new, new um, AIS capabilities deployed uh, later this year that I think will really bring a, a richness to the kind of relationship that we've had. But again, to, to your point, it's still, um, you know, it's, it has been incumbent on us and a, a, a real uh, focus of ours to make sure that we have more two-way exchange. And, and a lot of times that really just means, uh, again, um, bringing people together. So we have embedded within our threat hunting teams um, analysts from each of the major threat intelligence providers um, and, and other industry uh, embeds. And so that helps us to ensure that we're seeing what they're seeing, that they're seeing what we're seeing, um, and that we understand it and how important it is. Uh, again, sometimes the signal gets lost in the noise with just the volume of data that we see. And so, you know, really important for us to, to be able to raise that uh, with uh, a trusted partner. And I think that uh, what, what's important here that you highlight is two things, the, the trust, the two-way exchange, but also you got me go, you know, you got me a little excited here about the uh, new evolution of AIS is, is without jumping in ahead of any news here, is there anything more you can tell us about what that maybe in, it would entail or what that would look like? Well, I think the most important thing to, to um, just in, in the way of a teaser and really feedback that we have uh, broadly, but particularly from industry is that when you publish in the volume that we do, with the limited ability to provide context around why you should care about this or how it matters to you or where it came from, something that you could use to prioritize, um, then it makes that information really hard to use and things fall through the cracks. And so I think the most important, one of the important things that we're gonna see here is just more ability to have additional context that will allow the information that we are providing through AIS to be a lot more useful and a lot more impactful. And I think that's probably um, something that we've long sought to do and, and now feel like the, the, um, the, the structural mechanics from the, from the specifications are there to support that. All right, more to follow up on that, I'm sure, and I'll be excited to uh, learn about it as you guys uh, roll out the changes. Uh, I have to ask, any timeline yet, or is that uh, one of those uh, government terms of soon? Soon. Soon, very good. Soon. <laughs> I get it. You know, there's, there's always, there's always the jump, the hoops that you have to jump through, even, even uh, best laid plans. Let me, let me ask about the other piece of this that, that you brought up when it comes to information sharing, which is the, on the classified side. And I realize you, there's limits you can take, but it's, I think there's one, one concern with industry has been, well, how can we share, how can we get access to that classified information? Or how can you take classified information? And if you will, take it down a level so I still get the value from it, but it's at an unclassified level. Is, is what it has changed from your perspective or what needs to change from your perspective to meet both of those goals, whether it's at a classified level or an unclassified level? Yeah, that's, I mean, it's, it's a good question. It's an important question. Um, for, in the big picture, and, and I think this is the, the easiest way to kind of frame this uh, conceptually over the last, I mean, let's be generous and call it 10 years, but it's really hasn't been that long, but uh, generously over the last 10 years, um, the environment has changed significantly in the sense that there are commercial companies, commercial providers that have a much broader deployment footprint, which means a much more visibility into networks and hosts than the U S government does. This changes the perspective, in my mind, of uh, where the information is going to come from. Um, there are certainly some things that you would expect to see first and maybe only through classified holdings. And, and mainly those are from the work that our intelligence community partners are going to be doing as they conduct their missions inside of the adversary's space, inside of foreign space, where maybe there's a limited footprint of U.S. commercial technology that's deployed. But here in the United States, uh, as big as the .gov is, it pales in comparison to the .com, where we have um, so many you know, commercial companies that have that visibility. And so I think one of the, the things that's happening in the point in time that we're in now 
is that there is more threat intelligence coming from commercial sources than classified sources. And it is often coming faster because of um, really, I'd say the speed of industry, but also um, the th things like classification and other things just slow things down. And so I, I think, you know, in the, in the real true spirit of your question, we are working all the time to, with, with our IC colleagues to downgrade things as quickly as we can to get them out to the people that need to respond to uh, an emerging threat or vulnerability. And I think we continue to do better and better at that. But at the same time that we're doing that, um, we're leveraging commercial industry just to the, the same way that, um, and by commercial industry in this case, I mean the, the cybersecurity threat companies, the threat Intel companies, the EDR companies, the IT companies, um, we're leveraging their information uh, just like it, uh, you know, the broader industry can because of just the, the, you know, the, the breadth of what they see. I think that's a great point that sometimes gets lost in this discussion that when you talk about two-way sharing and how all oh, the government takes but never gives, well, now the government is receiving, I would say, versus taking because of, of exactly what you described, which is this idea that that whether it's an, uh, an AT&T or a Verizon or whether it's one of the more traditional companies like Symantec or McAfee or whomever, you know, the goal here is to, they have a broader view that they can then provide the, the government. Uh, one last piece about information sharing, I think that's important is how is then CISA delivering that information over to agencies? Uh, I know through the continuous diagnostics and mitigation, the CVM program, we'll talk about that in a little bit as well later in the show, but that's one way through the dashboards, but are, is there other ways or other, how, how things have evolved from the way CISA shares threat intelligence with agencies? Yeah, and I think, it really the model that we described um, up front is th that is generally the way I think about information sharing is also specifically the way that it works within the federal departments and agencies for which we have responsibilities. You know, we're convening on a, on a very regular and frequent basis, uh, threat briefings to them and exchanging threat information. And, and uh, I've got one of those coming up this, this next week. Cause again, it, um, Yes, there's a lot of technical and automation that needs to happen, but we need analysts to say, Here, here's why you really have to pay attention to this, and here's what it means for some of the decisions that you're gonna be making from a risk management perspective on the long term, uh, over the long term. Um, in addition to that, um, there are things that we can do through automation and at scale, um, taking uh, indicators and um, deploying them in Einstein, deploying them at the trusted internet connection that the agencies have so that uh, at a system-wide basis, we are protecting against uh, those, those malicious actors or protecting against the, those vulnerabilities. Um, and, and then much of our customer base for AIS, as I mentioned before, are also those, those federal departments and agencies. And so it's, it's kind of the combination of of, uh, I'd say that the difference between the, our .gov mission and our broader state, local, and commercial mission is that we also have Einstein, we have the, the, the NCPS, that we're able to, um, to kind of take some of those threats away uh, by default and at scale. All right, and we're gonna talk about some of those threats uh, after we take a quick break. So let's take a quick break. I'm Jason Miller, and you're listening to Ask the CIO, sponsored by CyberArk on Federal News Network. 